Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a more unusual topic of the so-called pulsar planets. Planets orbiting neutron stars and planets that we've actually found. Let's talk a little bit more about this and welcome to What The Mac. If you know the history of the discovery of exoplanets, you probably know that this right here is the first exoplanet ever discovered. But it's not a very popular exoplanet, mostly because of the system it's located in. This is an exoplanet orbiting a very very interesting but also extremely scary and powerful neutron star that you can kind of see right there. If we were to approach it, it would look like no star that's familiar to us. It's a very small, very compact object, it produces a tremendous amount of energy, and it's also most likely extremely destructive. But this system has not one, not two, but actually three different exoplanets. And for quite a while now, all three of them had names that are associated with the scary world of undead. The first planet is known as Draugr, the second planet is Poltergeist, and the third planet is Phobitor. All three are essentially these really scary spirits from the world of the undead, and the star itself, the one that you can kind of see right there, is known as Lich. NASA has even created this somewhat cute poster to commemorate these three planets, and for pretty much, I guess, 28 years now, they've sort of been lost to history in a sense. But when these three planets were originally discovered, it was extremely exciting. First of all, of course, that this was the first ever exoplanet confirmation. Second of all, because we suddenly thought that we're going to discover a lot of these exoplanets everywhere. And third of all, because we didn't really know any other planets existed back then. This is way before Kepler, way before any other telescope was able to discover so many exoplanets as we know of today. But it shouldn't come as a surprise that these planets were discovered, because seeing objects orbiting pulsars is not actually really that difficult, mostly because pulsars today are known as the most precise clocks in the universe. Here are the repetitions from the famous Crab pulsar, and they're even more precise than the most precise atomic clock that we have and use in various scientific explorations. So when we observe something that seems to deviate from this repetitive pattern, and when that something happens periodically, there's only one explanation, something is orbiting this particular pulsar. By looking at these deviations coming from the pulsar known as the Lich, the scientists discovered that there were three very specific patterns that could only be explained as planets, with two of these planets being three to four times more massive than planet Earth, with one of them being the smallest and the least massive planet ever discovered, at only about 2% the mass of Earth, very similar to our own moon. So these initial discoveries were definitely very, very exciting. But then it took a few years before we discovered more of these so-called pulsar planets. The next discovery was actually even more exciting because it was the oldest planet we've ever discovered. It even became known as the Methuselah planet after the mysterious biblical character. And this unusual planet was the first of many things. It was the oldest. It was also the first planet discovered inside a globular cluster because as you can see here, it's part of a very large, very massive globular cluster. But it also orbited the central region where the pulsar was located approximately every 100 years. And the planet itself was really big. Current calculations put it at about two and a half masses of Jupiter. So this was the first really massive Jupiter-like object discovered in such an unusual location in such an unusual orbit. Then we discovered two more really massive planets around pulsars um, a few years ago, and lastly we discovered one more possible object in 2017 that's approximately two masses of planet Earth. But since then there haven't really been any new discoveries, and the initial assumption that we're going to discover a lot more, possibly hundreds of these pulsar planets, has kind of disappeared. There haven't really been new discoveries coming from pulsars for a really long time, except for one peculiar pulsar that seems to possess an accretion disk around it which suggests that planets can definitely form, we haven't found anything to suggest that pulsar planets are as common as we originally thought they were going to be. When the Kepler telescope came out, when a lot of other telescopes started to detect planets, we actually started to realize that these planets might be extremely rare and it's very possible that we just got super lucky. But at the same time, we're kind of back to the mystery of not really knowing if all neutron stars and all pulsars have objects orbiting them, or if only some selective ones do, 
and those that have planets will have these unusual observations that we can usually detect. And so to try to answer some of these questions, these scientists who published this paper decided to find out if we can maybe find more pulsar planets in older data from pulsars somewhere out there, and essentially just try to double check some of the previous discoveries by using some of the more modern and some of the more advanced analysis. And the main purpose is of course to see if pulsar planets are common or if they're just actually really rare and we got lucky. A lot of the data came from this very accurate observation that was done over a period of about 11 years using the so-called NANOGRAV, which stands for North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. And the idea here was to focus on 45 different pulsars to try to see if any planets can be discovered around them while at the same time seeing if some of the previous discoveries may have missed something as well. And without exception, around all of these 45 pulsars, no planets were discovered. There were no planets found in orbits between 7 and 2000 days, and no other orbiting masses up to about mass of Earth, or in some cases even up to about mass of the Moon. Which unfortunately suggests that a lot of these pulsars are probably completely alone, completely by themselves, and might only have some minor matter orbiting around them, not actual planets like the ones we've discovered in the previous decades. And this of course creates a question. Why is it so? Why are pulsar planets so rare? And why is it that we're having trouble finding them? Well, obviously one answer is that pulsars are not really that common. A lot of neutron stars are actually very, very quiet. They don't produce enough light or any other emissions for us to detect anything. But at the same time, a much bigger answer comes from the creation story of pulsar planets and possibly pulsars themselves. We already know that accretion disks can exist around pulsars, and this study right here established that young pulsars definitely have accretion disks that can technically produce planets, but what we don't know is what happens to these accretion disks eventually. They might actually end up just falling into the neutron star and producing a lot of emissions, or maybe they do create something. Now, it's also really important to talk about the possible ways planets can be created around pulsars. One of these ways is, of course, if a planet that's already in orbit around the previous star, before it becomes a pulsar, manages to somehow survive the supernova. And here I wanted to try to simulate this using Universe Sandbox just to see if this planet survives the supernova as well. In order for the pulsar to be created, a type 2 supernova must occur. And these supernovae are pretty powerful, but technically they can actually spare a planet or two that are orbiting on the vicinity somewhere farther away from the pulsar itself. In this case, I decided to place this planet pretty close, just to see how it reacts to the sudden heating by the supernova itself. And you can kind of see that one of its sides has already heated up to the point where it's probably going to start evaporating pretty soon. So let's just wait here a little bit and Let's see what happens, and as you can kind of see, unfortunately for the planet, it does not survive the supernova and also the relatively close passage to the um, pulsar. And only after a few hours, that's pretty much all that's left here. I managed to create an accretion disk, but the planet is gone. So most planets probably end up as this, after the supernova and when the pulsar is created. But some planets might survive. At the same time, sometimes the supernova itself will actually eventually produce a very large amount of dust in the vicinity here, the dust that doesn't actually fly too far away from the star, and all of this will come back toward the neutron star and create what's known as a fallback disk. In some sense, you can kind of think of this disk right here as a very miniature version of that fallback disk. From that disk, if it orbits at far enough distances, Planets can technically start forming as well, in the same way that they formed around a typical younger star like our Sun. And even though we've never really seen this happening, since we know the accretion disks are possible around neutron stars, and since we know that these might contain materials needed for planets to form, there's really nothing for us to sort of assume that planetary formation is not possible that way as well. But planets can also form around neutron stars in slightly more unusual ways. For example, if a neutron star also has a smaller partner, or a, basically a star orbiting around it relatively close, with time this star will actually start losing mass to the neutron star, and at some point might become a planet that way. So a typical evaporating star can also produce a planetary object around a neutron star. We don't know for how long, but it is possible. And the alternative method here is if the star is even closer and ends up completely falling apart creating a very large disk of matter around the neutron star, once again creating the disk from which other objects can form. 
All of these methods are theoretically possible, we've obviously never observed them, but these four methods is how we believe some neutron stars can actually form planets. Nevertheless though, it's very unusual that we haven't really been able to find more of these strange planets around other neutron stars out there. So even though initially these were the first planets discovered and these were the most unusual planets discovered to date, right now we're actually kind of having problems explaining why no other planets were discovered since. For example, this interesting device installed on the International Space Station by NASA has been doing a really good job at looking at various pulsars and neutron stars for the past few years. We've also obviously discovered over 2000 different pulsars out there, so at least some of them are bound to have something around them. But the more pulsars we discover, the more we realize that the planets around them are actually kind of strangely rare. And that is currently a bit of a mystery. At the same time, one of the possible explanations is that most scientists today focus on looking for planets around other stars using other telescopes, like the incredible TESS telescope that you see right here. And if most scientists use these telescopes to look for exoplanets, maybe there's just nobody looking for pulsar planets anymore. So this could be one potential explanation, just not enough people looking and analyzing the data. But at least something should have been found by these scientists, and they've discovered nothing. And statistically, this doesn't really make much sense. So, this is kind of where we are right now with the pulsar planets. We've discovered some of them in the beginning, they were some of the stranger and more unusual planets, they also were some of the more exciting discoveries, and then suddenly all of these discoveries stopped. Now, we are stuck in a mystery where we don't really know if pulsar planets are just extremely rare and we get super super lucky in the beginning, or maybe nobody is just looking for pulsar planets anymore because we have other means to look for exoplanets today. But I'm sure in the next few years we'll figure this out. I'm sure someone will find something around a pulsar somewhere out there and we'll probably talk about this in one of the future videos. Until then, looks like it's a mystery that we need to solve. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Maybe support this channel on Patreon, and maybe support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.